Navigating the Norlin era can be pretty tough. Let's see if I can help. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglodytes Guitar Show. Today, we are documenting this absolutely gorgeous 1977 Gibson Les Paul Custom. We had unboxed it in this episode, but it had just such a beautiful flying top to it, an awesome figured neck. It actually ended up being a little bit more heavily played than I had initially anticipated, but I found something while cleaning that I thought would be a good learning point, and I get people asking me all the time, what kind of 70s or 80s custom should I get? So let's do a quick lowdown on the Norlin era of Les Paul Customs. So there's five main categories to Norland era customs. The first category is from 1968 through early 1970. These are some of the most expensive because it's the first time Gibson brought the Les Paul back after discontinuing them around 1961-ish, as far as the body shape we're talking about today anyway. And the reason why a 1968 is so valuable is the fact that it still has 50 specs for the most part. But starting in 69, you start to get the addition of the volute. You also have the pancake body starting to sneak in. Your two-piece maple top starts to transition into three-piece tops, as well as the three-piece mahogany necks. Generally speaking, you're going to have two pickups that are patent number T-tops in these guys. And every change from 50 specs slowly devalues them as far as the vintage market is concerned. So our next category is from about mid-1970 till about 19. There are surprisingly few customs actually from this era. If you go onto Reverb and you look at things that are advertised as 70, 71, 72, most times they're not the most accurate. But these are pretty valuable guitars in their own right. You also start to see some colors get introduced. So instead of just ebony finish, you get things like Cherry Sunburst. In 72, they did do a reissue of the 54 style Les Paul Custom. And in 1972, they had these really cool embossed Gibson pickup covers. That's why 72s are worth the premium, because those pickups are worth a lot and makes them cool. And now we move into the next category, 1973 through about 1975. These are very common and plentiful on the market, mainly because they're very easy to identify, because serial numbers through late 1975 really don't mean much. But in late 75, we start to see the decal serial numbers come out that have a leading 9-9 in the front. But also, it's really easy to identify 1974 because most of them had a 20th anniversary inlay on the 12th fret. And this is also when you see a lot more colors come into play. Now we don't just have black and cherry sun burst and a few custom colors, you've got the vintage and or tobacco sunburst, you get the wine red, and obviously the introduction of the ever famous white finish on the Les Paul Custom. So our next category is one of my favorites, and the one that the guitar we're talking about today comes from, the 1976 through about 81 slash 82. So this is when Nashville opens up. I mean, it technically opened in 1975. So you can find customs built in Nashville as well as Kalamazoo. And there are differences between those. The easiest way to tell which one yours was made as is the size of your side marker inlays. If they're tiny, they're Nashville. If they're big, they're going to be Kalamazoo. And if you shine a light on them, they'll actually be tortoiseshell colored. It's during that time that the Nashville bridge gets introduced. So after about 1975, the ABR1 disappears on these for a while. But this is the new main era where maple necks come into effect. Definitely by 76, you'll have a maple neck. Now, can you find some as far back as 1974 that technically have the maple neck? Yes, but it wasn't a big general spec until very solidly in 1976. Then we were talking about the decal serial numbers. So those years are 1975, 1976, and early 1977, because mid-1977 is when everybody's favorite year, day, 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 year, XXX serial number gets put in into place. We can finally date these guitars accurate down to the day. Now you gotta remember, that's just when the neck was stamped, not when the guitar was completed, but now people can find birthday and anniversary year guitars. Prior to this, the best way to date your guitar was by your pot codes. And this is also when the patent number T-tops change over into the base plate that actually says patent number T-top instead of having those nice stickers. In fact, I think it's 1975 is the earliest you'll find this new base plate style. And then in late 1980, you start to see Tim Shaw's work their way into the customs. But the reason why I segment it between 1976 through 1981 and then the 82s through about late 1986 is because that's when you start to see the transition out of the maple necks back into mahogany, you start to see the volute disappear, the nine hole weight relief starts to come into play. That's also when they start using CNC machines to route the insides of the guitar. 1982 starts the special parts that only lasted like a year. We're talking like the posi lock strap locks, the three point top adjust bridge, the crank tuners. 
the cool PAF stickers on the pickup rings. And even though the Norland era technically ends after 1985, you really don't see the custom start to change until about late 1987, and that's because the pickups start to swap. But you could also further clarify these down into two different categories before 1975 and after 1975. The biggest difference is the mahogany versus maple neck. The pre-75s are going to have smaller, thinner fret wire that a lot of people don't like, including myself. Whereas the post-75s, they still have low frets, but they're wider, which makes bending a little bit easier, but both style generally not as easy to bend on as modern day frets. And they all have their own thing going for it. I love the 76 through 83 customs. But to learn a little bit more about this one, let's go ahead and throw it on the workbench to take a look at its parts and specs to see what else might make it special. Whew, that was a lot of information, and there's so many other minute details. I mean, it, it'd be really hard to get everything down unless I had an example of every single year right in front of me. That way, you know, it's easier to compile and look at all the differences in person. But today, let's check out a 77 Les Paul Custom. So from all that information that we just learned, it's a fairly early maple neck iteration. We've got the new serial number style on it that's only like about a year old at this point. It's still a three-piece maple top. That doesn't mean you can't find custom order two piecers, but we've got the tiny dots along the edges. So that tells us this is a Nashville made model. And we've got the still fairly new Gibson Nashville style bridge. But anyways, inside here we have our patent number engraved T-tops and these ones have the date dating it to 1978. Looks like 17th day of March. And our bridge pickup looks like the 21st of 1978 also in March. And you see tearing this apart, I, I remember a lot of things I missed, like I didn't even talk about neck tenons. But to fill you guys in, it's about the time when Nashville comes in. You go from a long neck tenon in the late 60s, and then you have the transitional neck tenon until about 1975 when they go into these short neck tenons. But here we can see we do have a natural stamp right here. And then we have a lady's name in our bridge pickup cavity. It looks like this one reads Brenda, which some guys joke that it was a secret grading and what name you have is where it lies on the totem pole. But I've also heard stories where it's just, it was popular to put your girlfriend's name at the time in the guitars that you worked on. But here we can see our solid mahogany body with our three piece maple top. And the gold on the covers definitely has some wear on this particular example. And unfortunately, our neck pickup ring is cracked right around here, but the height adjustment spring keeps it together enough as long as you're not pulling it in and out. But typically speaking, T-tops are around seven and a half ish. So 7.4 on this example in our bridge, neck position 7.48 ish. And then just for fun, our middle 3.72. Here's a look at that Nashville style bridge. Basically the biggest difference between Nashville and ABR1 is the fact that you actually have a stud in the body, whereas an ABR1 is just drilled directly into the top. But these were Schaller made in Germany, as you can see right here. And here's our tailpiece. You can tell it's the original one because of this casting mark in the center. If you have a 70s or 80s Les Paul Custom and it goes all the way to the edges, that has been replaced. Now in the 2000s, that starts to change. So it's not a blanket statement for all customs, but 70s and 80s, they should look like this. Now let's just take a look at this beautiful example here. Not all of them are as nice and wood grainy as this or have all the cool flame figuring. That's why I wanted to document this one because it's just such a fantastic example. Now, if you remember that unboxing episode, it had some replaced parts and the switch tip was destroyed in shipping, but I just happened to have a vintage one just get ordered. It looks a little bit more yellow in person. And the vintage speed knobs are definitely looking nice and aged as well. It's almost a shame to put a pick guard on this one because it's just so beautiful, but this was really crusty underneath the pick guard. This is definitely a lot cleaner now. But condition wise, you got a lot of dings in this area. Must have had something on his sleeve or jacket or something going on. On. It's definitely not a mint condition example. Moving on from our body, we have the maple neck with the ebony fretboard. This one still has our original frets in here, and you've got your mother of pearl block inlays. This was pretty grimy when I got it, that's why I decided to do the full cleaning. There's a bunch of finger cheese on here. In fact, you can kind of still see the discoloration of it, but it's just no longer there. It's been cleaned off. Now, as far as the current condition of the frets, you definitely have some light divoting. I know they look super deep, but they're pretty shallow. This would be a perfect candidate for a level recrown job. And I wish I had a traveling luthier that I could say, oh yeah, I've got a level recrown when everyone to stop by, get that done, because I would totally get that done. But that's above what I do on working with guitars. I just like to clean them up. It seems like it's going to play just fine. And okay, yep, now I remember more. Uh, the nut widths are different. Post 75, they're a little bit wider. 
Before that, the necks, when they're mahogany, they are a little bit skinnier. But this maple neck version is 1.67 inches. And that increases to 2.04 by the 12th. First fret neck depth is 0.82. And it measures 1.02 by the 12th, but you should really probably take it at the 10th fret where you can see it's 0.95. These are slim 60s necks. You just start to get the heel by the 12th. Here's that neck at the first and 12th fret. That's the standard rule of thumb for these anyways. Can you find bigger necks? Yes. If you're really looking for one of those, I find 1976 is a year where they are just a little bit fuller. Generally speaking, Kalamazoo necks are a little bit chunkier as well. So you might seek out a KZ made example, but always get measurements because these were hand sanded. So some are just a little bit different but our headstock is just phenomenal on this example. Like it hasn't overly aged and that's always great for natural customs. I mean, you can see it's yellowed. This would have started life more of like a pure natural finish. It has aged, but not as much as some like silver bursts and whatnot. Another thing I didn't really touch upon too much is the fact that the Gibson logo changes quite a bit in these eras. But to be honest, I've never really been too big into that because if you know enough about all the other stuff, you, you really don't need that information because a lot of time just looking at the logo can steer you wrong when it comes to the early Norlin era. But no, my friends, it's the headstock that made me want to document this one. Do you see this? It says RL. Who do we know that works at Gibson at this time? Is that Randy Leonard? Well, apparently he gets messages about this all the time. No, that's actually his brother, Ricky Leonard. He worked for Gibson for a few years. And whenever you have initials in here, that's the person who did the fret filing at the factory originally. So if you've got a New Orleans era custom, pop off your truss rod cover and see who worked on your guitar. I think that's the first time I've seen an RL. Or maybe it's just the first time it's been brought to my attention that I should be looking for it. Oh, looking at the nut, that's another difference between KZ made ones in Nashville, is they'll have bone nuts. That's another easy way to tell. But there's always transitional periods for everything. That's why if you ever need help with a Norlin era custom, my private help sessions on my website, they're well worth the money in my opinion because I, I've had almost all of them. So I can usually help guide you pretty well. The truss rod cover reads Les Paul Custom. These also start to change when Nashville comes into play, this whole stylizing of the plastic. And now we get to move on to the beautiful natural back here. Looks nice and clean, but when you get it in the light, this definitely has its fair share of buckle worming. Just in case you're not familiar with what worming is, it's like an impression into the clear coat. When it breaks through the clear coat slash finish, that's when you call it buckle rash. So worming is a, a little bit lesser of an evil. So there you go, there's your terms for the day. But now we get to talk about some more fun things. Also when Nashville came into play is when they kind of transitioned into these shielding tins, where basically they enclose the pots in these interesting tins. A lot of people just call them ashtrays, and that provides both shielding help as well as grounding it off. Because you're going to notice there is not a ground wire in this guitar. I would assume it has something to do with this bottom plate and shielding everything off. I'm not an expert when it comes to that kind of stuff. You do start to see the ground wire you know slowly wake make its way back some have it some don't you know starting in the 80s but pot codes are nice and easy to read so it's gonna say 137 you can't see it because it's hidden right there and then 78 tells you the year is produced 1978 and then there's two more digits after that that tell you the week of production so it's the 30th something week of 1978 and looking at this one it's completely readable so it's the actual 30th week of 1978 so very cool this is just a nice untouched custom it had a few plastic were placed on it when I first got it, but that was easy enough to swap back. I even got some original style strap buttons. So had I not said anything, I'm sure if I were to pass this one on, it would eventually get sold by another dealer as completely original. But late Norland era customs get thick binding in the cutaway. And another thing I forgot to touch upon is when pancake bodies start to go away. You can find them all the way until 1979. I'm not saying it's common, but I've seen a 79 with a pancake body. But generally speaking, it's about 1976 when they start to transition away from doing those. And I'm not saying pancake bodies are bad. It's just there's a, a few examples on the internet where they started to separate that gave them a bad name. The pancakes are just two pieces of mahogany and a center stripe of maple. And it was actually a little bit more labor intensive to create. But then they could also use thinner pieces of mahogany. Uh, check out our beautiful three-piece maple neck. 
I really like maple necks. It's the Norland era customs are the reason why I enjoy maple necks so much. Generally, it's because you can find so much beautiful figuring within them, but even when they're plain, they're just nice. You can also find a five-piece neck in this era. Generally not on a custom, it'd be something like a 25, 50th anniversary, where instead of just putting the maple all together, they put walnut in between. And here's another thing I can touch upon. When Nashville started to come into play, that's when they switched over to these Gibson-style Schaller tuners. These are still phenomenal tuners even yet to today. But like those pre-75 ones when we're talking about the waffle back tuners, they're the coolest looking tuners ever, but they did not stand the test of time. These did. So generally speaking, those like 1970 through 1975-ish customs will have replaced tuners. But here's our awesome serial number that just makes sense. Dates it to 1978, 311th day of the year, so it's a pretty late one. 569th in production. Oh, and the whole 75 through 1977, before you get this new serial number style, that's the era where it's kind of hard to tell if you have a Nashville made or a Kalamazoo made. But once the serial number style was introduced, they made it easy. So if it's 500 or higher, it's Nashville. If it's under 500, it's Kalamazoo. You also do get the introduction of the Made in USA stamp. It's very faint on this example, but it is there. Just reads it this way. So Kalamazoo ones are stamped vertically. Most times that th there are some exceptions to that rule and Nashville's typically horizontally. Oh, and hey, do you see what I see right there? It's a circle. That's probably because somebody left a clip-on tuner on it for a long period of time. I bet that's gonna show up in blacklight. Actually, I'm surprised it didn't. It must not have had a rubber backing to it. It must have just been an impression that was left there. But it's looking like everything is good here. There is kind of a strange mark right here. I noticed that in normal lighting situations. It's not a brake cracker or a pair, but it might be a marker or something. It also could just be natural wood grain. It's kind of hard to tell. I'm not concerned about it in the slightest, though. And despite how much this one's been played, it does not look like we've worn through the clear coat at all. It's definitely well taken care of, but not completely babied, as you can tell by all the buckle worming. He must have had a big buckle on, that's for sure. Now we can also look at the top. Everything's looking peachy here. Knobs glowing the way we would expect to see, as is the face of our headstock. Here's that area under regular lighting situations. I think you can see how it just kind of looks like a marker, but the fact that it didn't glow differently under black light seems to suggest it, it might just be in the wood. All said and done, these are usually pretty heavy guitars, but this one is 9 pounds, 10.9 ounces. That's actually considered a light one, believe it or not. Your average is pretty much exactly on 10 pounds. But it feels so light, because some of these can be 11, 12 pound boat anchors. So let's go ahead and plug this one in and hear how it sounds. <laughs> Man, it feels great to have a New Orleans era custom again. Like, these are my first Les Paul customs, that first era I fell in love with. So they just feel like home to me. They've got that perfect neck profile. They've got really flat frets, so you don't have to worry so much about bending out of tune. Even if you're really pressing down. You just don't get as much bending. Go ahead and kick on some dirt.
Now that we know all about this beautiful natural Les Paul custom from 1977, what are my final thoughts on this? If you're looking for those nice vintage warm round tones that the T-tops deliver, you're going to enjoy these guitars. Even if you don't like those, you can always swap out the pickups, although I would definitely suggest at least keeping the original pickups with you because they hold some substantial value. Now, they're not crazy like original PAFs or anything. Generally, a set will run you somewhere between $400 and $1,000, just depending on what kind that you actually have to get. But I am very pleased with this guitar. It cleaned up nicely. It's got some nice wood figuring. It plays nicely, and it sounded good to me. And after a little bit of money thrown into restoration to getting all the original parts, it's looking the part. Now, am I going to keep this one? I'm on the fence. Like, if there was a strong enough offer, since the condition isn't what I normally collect, you might be able to strong arm this one off me, but I'm gonna hold it back, I think, for now, just because of the awesome figuring, because not all natural customs look quite as good as this one. But anyways, I hope you guys enjoy checking out this guitar with me today. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day. And you might even enjoy this next one.